Hi everyone, happy Saturday, hope you're doing great. So it's the sixth sober session and today we're talking about alcohol and beliefs or as Dave says, misbeliefs. I definitely had a whole bunch of limiting beliefs going on when it came to quitting drinking. I used to think I couldn't have fun without alcohol. I used alcohol, I believe, to calm my anxiety and alcohol helped me de-stress. And we're going to talk a whole lot about beliefs that can limit you, beliefs that can hold you back. And we've got a really awesome special guest today who is a colleague of mine, actually. We both work for This Naked Mind. You might have read the book by Annie Grace. And it's Scott Pinyard, who's the head coach at This Naked Mind. Scott, how are you doing? I am awesome. How are you, Simon? Yeah, I'm doing great, thanks. I hope the lockdown's treating you well. Uh, yeah, pretty good. I get, you know, time to lock myself up here in my office and do stuff like this, which is awesome. My kids are outside, which is also cool, so you probably won't hear them in the background. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been, I found I've been really productive and trying to make the most of the opportunities that it's presenting rather than kind of wallowing in, feeling like I'm cooped up indoors all the time. So, well, yeah, we're going to talk about beliefs, limiting beliefs. I would guess a good place to start is what beliefs did you have when you were drinking? Yeah, well, I want to, um, I'll go into that in a second, but I want to tell you why this is my favorite topic. Yeah, so yeah. Simon, right. Simon asked me earlier this week, what do you want to talk about on this call? And I was like, oh, beliefs. Um, because it is amazing to me how true they seem and now how not true they seem. Um, like it's just astonishing. And so, um, so to answer your question, Simon, you know, there's, I had a huge belief around being social, like doing actually something like this at Simon is the only one of you that I've met before. Well, that's not true. I've met William before, but, um, Simon, I know really well. And, you know, something like this would have absolutely been I, a trigger for a drink. It would have absolutely, and I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have dreamed of even starting this conversation without maybe even having a drink first. And now that idea is so crazy for me. So being social was a huge one. Connecting with people was a huge one too. I was a big fan of the, you know, the drunk, like, I love you, man, sort of conversation. Um, and, uh, you know, I thought that that's really was that connection. And it's funny when I look back now, like uh, my best friend is, uh, he's alcohol free now. He's, uh, he started before I did. I, he's coming up on 10 years. Um, wow. And I remember we used to have a lot of those, you know, drunken hug conversations. And I am so much closer to him now than I actually was then. And I haven't said I love you to him in a long time. <laughs> Maybe you should. Yeah, I probably should. I probably, he might be watching. Colin, if you're watching, I love you, man. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's yeah, so those, those are two of my biggest. Another one um, that I had was traveling. Um, and the idea that like connected with travel was experiencing. So, you know, it's an interesting time with everywhere. I live in Portland, Maine. And so this place is just lousy with breweries. I mean, there's like a new one opening every, every week. Um, and that's been going on for a long time. And so back when I was still drinking, traveling, that was how I experienced the city. So I would go to the breweries or the distilleries or the wineries. Um, and then also things like, you know, what did I do on a plane? So traveling and needing alcohol, I need alcohol to travel was a big one for me too. Yeah, and I think it's, I guess, a, an important part sort of early in the journey around quitting drinking is to actually bring those beliefs out into the light and, and get some clarity on them. And I, I know you've got some pretty awesome tactics for that. Are you happy to kind of maybe share how you get them out into the light and get clarity and kind of turn them into a non-limiting belief yeah i didn't know i was going to teach on this simon you well yeah me. there's always a bit of coaching <laughs> and some tactics we like I'm some just takeaways kidding. just kidding so so here's the thing about beliefs right and this is another reason why i think it's so cool i love this topic um is that we hold these things i never really said to myself i need alcohol to be social right that wasn't like a sentence that was running in my head i would just kind of feel these feelings and then I would grab a drink and then I wouldn't feel those feelings anymore. And then the cycle would go on. So a lot of these beliefs are subconscious. These are things, these are stories that we tell ourselves. These are scripts that we've made over years of experience. And the funny thing about the subconscious um, is that it's, it's not necessarily the most intelligent part of your brain, right? It's up in the prefrontal cortex where we do all of our advanced processing. Um, so beliefs can be kind of kind of silly. Like I, I always give the example, my son Murray, who is five years old, if you ask him, how can you tell how old someone is? 
he will tell you that the taller they are, the older they are. This makes perfect sense to a five-year-old. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, in the sense that he's growing. So every time he's growing, he's taller on every birthday. Um, and so a lot of times I use that as an example that we kind of form these subconscious beliefs on incomplete information, but then we carry them around with us, right? We live by them. They're almost like scripts. Um, and so that's what happens when someone comes to quit drinking and they have a lot of drinking beliefs. There tend to be these sort of subconscious scripts. Um, and we have a technique that Annie Grace uh, came up with, which is called the ACT technique, um, which is all about, first of all, how do we find those beliefs? How do we identify those beliefs? And then how do we change those beliefs? Um, and so ACT really quickly is awareness, clarity, turnaround. Right, so awareness is what is your belief? Um, now, that's always kind of a tricky part, right? Because I said they were subconscious, so it's not like popping up in your head. Um, but very often we do that through the emotions that we're feeling, through the actions like unexplained behavior. Um, we start to kind of look at, man, I wonder what this belief is. When you hit on it, you can tell because you, you'll, have a, you'll have an emotional reaction. Um, and so once you've done that, you've kind of pulled that belief from the subconscious into the conscious. That's where we can get to work on it with the next step, which is clarity. Um, and so clarity is very simple, right? We want to understand where did this belief come from, right? What in my past told me that I need alcohol to be sociable, right? And this is where when I work with people, they go way far back. We'll go back to when they started drinking, right? What was going on then? What were some sort of milestone experiences? Then we get an idea of what is the actual evidence behind this belief, right? So for my son, that evidence is that he knows people who are older than him who are taller. But, and I haven't told him this yet because I don't know if this is bad parenting. I love that he thinks this. So I don't <laughs> want to point out to him that my brother-in-law, who is four years younger than me, is six seven, <laughs> And my mother-in-law, who is like 100 years older than me, is like 5'4". Right? So I haven't shown him that yet, but this is essentially what that part of the process is. It's where we look at the evidence for all of this stuff. And when it's in our conscious minds, that's when we can shine a light on it. And that's when we can really start to change it and look at the evidence and say, is this true? Is this not true? And then we move on to the last section, which is the turnaround. Um, so the turnaround, the T for an act, um, is all about coming up with an alternative belief, right? So what is that alternative belief? So to take it through something like alcohol, I need alcohol to have fun, say, right? And so I'll look back and I'll look back at college and I'll be like, oh yeah, I had all of this fun in college and I spent all this time drunk and that was like the catalyst and yada, yada, yada. Then I'll start to say, well, have I had fun without alcohol? And then I'll find all of these other places where I've had fun without alcohol. So the turnaround might be something along the lines of, I don't necessarily need alcohol to have fun, right? I don't actually have uh, to have a drink before coming on here and have fun with you guys. Um, and so that's the sort of technique that we use. Um, there's a little bit more to it. I don't want to go on and on about it. I could, but like that's, that's the technique. And it is amazing to me how using this technique shifted what for, you know, for me, this was before it was called the act technique, but using these ideas of changing our beliefs around drinking. Um, you know, I tried to quit drinking for over five years and I just quit after quit. You guys know what that's like, right? It's like trying and trying and trying and beating myself up. And it was amazing to me when I, finally started doing this, when I finally started trying to figure out what my beliefs were, like how that shifted and then everything changed for me. So that's the, that's the main tactic, Simon. That's the one that- Yeah, no, I really appreciate you sharing it because I think it's such a valuable thing for anyone watching. And you know, guys, if you've got any questions either for one of the panel or for Scott or you know, particularly around beliefs that you might be holding or if you're struggling to change a belief, then absolutely far away and it doesn't have to be about beliefs either so we'll just go around um, the panel and talk about how beliefs featured in your sober journey so Dave over to you right what I want to say actually to all the guys out there is that we've got a thing about William actually each week he comes on here he looks younger but <laughs> Simon you, you're looking 10 years younger today what the hell's going on well right, I did Scott, I shaved I'm my like, hair especially I'm and I had a shave my as beard well. down. <laughs> pull my beard down because you look like my younger brother. <laughs> What's all going on today? Um, I reckon yeah, Simon's my, been my, having cod liver uh, oil in his tea. Yeah, <laughs> I've been having Botox. <laughs> <laughs> 
Do you know what my belief that I always used to say to myself is ever I um, kind of thought I, I wanted to moderate, which is like never, was how am I going to sleep tonight without a drink? You know, and as William would tell you that you have a terrible night's sleep when you have a drink, actually. <laughs> and there was a couple of times in about 40 years I didn't have a drink. That's where I was with it. And I literally laid there at night thinking, I'm not going to get sleep. I'm not going to get to sleep because I believed that alcohol was making me sleep. And we all know that we get the three o'clock terrors in the morning and, and how crap that makes you feel. William, you can tell us more about that, can't you? About the uh, three o'clock a.m. terrors of waking up. Yeah, yeah, certainly if you'd like. So it's the old, um, the basic physiological effects of alcohol. So alcohol is a chemical sedative or depressant. So your brain reacts to that by trying to become oversensitive so it can work while under the depressant effects of the alcohol. So when the alcohol wears off, you're left overly, overly stimulated. And that's what anxiety and um, alcohol related anxiety and depression is basically. That's what it comes from. It comes from upsetting that chemical balance in your brain. Now, the problem is when you're drinking regularly, like you were, Dave, so your brain is used to that amount of alcohol going into you every day. Now, if you suddenly stop it, your brain hasn't caught up, so you're overly stimulated. So for regular drinkers who then cut out booze, they immediately can't sleep for a few nights because their brain's getting back on an even keel. Um, the three o'clock terrors you were talking about, that's essentially when the alcohol you've drunk wears off and that overstimulation kicks in. Um, and, and that's what it is. And that, I mean, that kicks into a few of our beliefs about alcohol because it kicks into alcohol makes me sleep. Um, but it also kicks in with alcohol, uh, this anxiety, it takes the edge off things, it makes life easier to cope with, it does the exact opposite. Um, and I think that's the thing with the beliefs, from what Scott was saying, it's totally true. It's, it's not only that it's not true, but often you find it's the complete opposite. Yeah. That was one thing, you know, that idea of uh, just talking about sleep. I remember I used, to, um, I used to regularly try to have one more drink so I could fall asleep which was never actually falling asleep. Um, so when it came to that, when it came to that belief, what I found after I got through those few days of, uh, you know, dealing with having a hard time falling asleep was that I was actually falling asleep then as opposed to passing out then, um, which is, yeah, was a regular occurrence for me. Hi, how about you? Hello. Oh, Alex, I think you had your hands up before, didn't you? You go um, first, please. Uh, okay. You were picking yeah, on ours. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm thinking about about beliefs I, I do think that during my first year of sobriety it was very much like it felt like a mental battle and a real key piece in that was that just having a kind of a fighter mindset on right it was like right I'm gonna make this my enemy I'm gonna fucking hate it I'm gonna make it my arch enemy number one and, and, and I like what you said about the kind of looking for the evidence, uh, Scott, as well, because the other thing I think that really changed it was, um, I mean, going back seven years, a lot of the received thinking was still that there were normal drinkers and then there were alcoholics. And yeah. then once, I think it was Jason Vale's book I read that was like calling bullshit on <laughs> basically all the messaging around it the you know the advertising the it was like the emperor's new clothes that kind of thing like we've all been sold this kind of nonsense about it and so that was really key for me that those kind of examining okay so we're sold it on we're sold it you can't connect without me you can't have a high day without me you can't uh, have fun without me you know those key human messages that send up our amygdala kind of like ah, I'm gonna be isolated I'm never gonna have fun again and all that kind of thing and um, yeah so I, I think shifting it almost like so there's two parts of that it's like okay I look at my own beliefs and maybe my history my family of origin some of that and some of those reasons and then outside okay but what is society telling me and that like little bit of a jigsaw you know can be quite powerful yeah that's a that, that's so true. And I, the, the bit about um, looking for the evidence, you know, I often say to people, be a bit like a defence and a prosecution in a courtroom when you look at your beliefs and, and really analyse everything that's going on and how true it is. And sure, there'll probably be some 
some fours, some against, but normally that belief statement is looks a whole lot weaker when you really start digging into it. It's so true. Alex, what, you, what did you want to go? Yeah, well, well, I was going to say just about sort of similar, but with a bit more, kind of, a bit less intelligence, I think. I was going <laughs> to. I used to just go out and think I was God's gift to everybody. I'm not talking like. Well, I'm you not are. Just talking, I, well, you know, but I actually really believed it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not I know about, this is true. <laughs> yeah, I'm not just talking about like a flirtatious nature where I thought, oh, I feel sexy, I feel good, which I did, by the way, think I would feel sexy and feel good. Um, and I didn't really have that many melted photos back in my 30s. But as I got certainly got a bit older and started to look back at my late night photos, what I realised was actually I just look like a burnt Barbie doll. I look melted, I look crusty, I look, uh, you know, <laughs> attractive or appealing about this face or anything about my persona. I couldn't speak, I would be slurring, you know, I don't really get where that comes from because, well, I do get it, I guess, because I think when you're in your early 20s or your late teens and you're drinking, that's where you meet your kind of boyfriends and your friends. It's surrounding alcohol. So you have this false belief that it's you that's attractive and not the environment that you're in and because of the alcohol. And it's only now I look at it and I think, when I deconstruct that, there was nothing attractive about me getting drunk, falling over or speaking badly to somebody or swearing and being vulgar. It was the company that I was in that was attractive. It was the way I felt Thank you. With those people. Yeah, you, Lisa. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I think, I think that's quite a common one, especially for younger women. I think that they get the confidence through alcohol to socialise and to date. You know, courage. I love that. I was, <clears throat> I was working with a client. This was around the holidays. And she was telling me, oh, well, we're trimming the tree tonight. And I, I always drink wine. I always, always drink wine when I trim the tree. And I'm like, all right, let's pull this apart. Let's deconstruct it like you're talking about, Alex. And I'm like, why are you excited for trimming the tree? Like, what is it about this, right, that you're looking forward to? And she listed off this list of things, you know, being with my family, putting up the lights. And then wine was at the bottom. I'm like, well, what if that wine wasn't on there? Would you still be excited? She's like, oh, I guess you're right. I'm like, yeah, exactly. It's the event, not necessarily the alcohol. <laughs> Sorry, William, I know what Dave is thinking. Dave is thinking about you in the bush. He totally is. Oh, dear. <laughs> Sorry, we don't know what's happened. Sorry, Kate. Look, look at the corner of your screen. What has what? happened to our nails? <laughs> I what? could see them two going there if it works. <laughs> My God. Hey, what happened? <laughs> no, this Scott said that I drink wine when trimming the tree and it is. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I should have said decorating the tree. It's <laughs> even worse. Oh, okay. <laughs> I guess you might be right. Well, I've, I've, just, I've only just got what you're being so funny. I, right, I understand now. Trimming the tree. <laughs> Let's get this back on track. Sorry, Scott. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, totally <laughs> we'll apologise for you too. <laughs> Go on, Lisa. You share um, about beliefs. We have a comment um, in the in the uh, in the Facebook group about um, seeing it as a treat, and I think that's a huge thing. It's that that thing, and it comes from up here. Um, saying, I can feel so strong on my sober journey, then I will be blindsided by the desire to drink wine and smoke like it's something I really look forward to and I really want to do even though I it makes me feel like shit will that ever go so I mean I guess the first thing is to say yes it will go if you can shift your mindset and if you see you know the if you can flip it and see all the joys of being alcohol free and if you can really focus on playing it forward and seeing you know enjoying your mornings um but also, I suppose it's, it's, as you say, with anything, it's like analysing that moment. It's like rituals. So it's like, well, that, there's obviously something you need at that moment in the day. Like it is that like, right, OK, I'm getting out of work mode. Like the kids are going to bed or it's my time or, you know, I get to sort of be my own person again. And that you've made this belief that intrinsically <coughs> alcohol is part of that. That's something you're looking forward to. But you can switch that to anything like it could be i'm really looking forward to going to bed and putting my pjs on i'm really looking forward 
to having a bath. I'm really looking forward to, um, you know, waking up in the morning and not being hungover. And there is going to be that difficult moment, especially if there's some depend dependence where it's going to be quite difficult and there's going to be some, some work to do to sort of shift that. But if you, if you hold tight and you just keep adding in things that you love and keep building on treats and keep making yourself feel good about your choice, then that definitely will go. Like I have no desire to drink ever. And, you know, I don't, I look forward to some at moment in my life being left alone by everybody and, and not being <laughs> with my family all the time. Um, but uh, did you just snort there, Kate? <laughs> Sorry, I really did, didn't I? <laughs> oh, I thought that was Alex. Um, but yeah, I think that that those, those sort of beliefs are a treat. And I have that, I mean, very much, I say this every week, because I live in France and my husband's French. And we have a wine cellar, blah, blah, blah. But those things are real. And so I know a lot about red wine. Like, you know, my husband's a connoisseur. We have amazing bottles. They're very expensive. It's very ritualized. It's very much you know taken as something very um, important in French culture it's not just like drink get pissed that's actually seen to be bad and and badly seen for people to be drunk it's very much about this beautiful thing that you're having amazing food and blah 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 so there's a lot to deconstruct there in terms of it being a treat and in terms of it being something um to yeah to to value in my life um but it's a dirty drug and i'm much better without it so just bring can i just add mandy to that we've got to remember a lot of this idea about it and this wonderful wine and this drunk and, and this drink and the fun it's sold to us and i think you know when i found out that basically it's all marketing from the very beginning <laughs> i was fuming that was one of the things that kept me sober, you know. I thought, how dare they? They tricked me my whole life. I remember the first time I'd moved into an apartment on my own. And I might have said this before, but I bought the magazine Cosmopolitan and I bought a bottle of white wine. And I sat there in my apartment at 17 <laughs> thinking I was really cosmopolitan and it was the thing to do and I didn't even like wine then I taught myself to like wine over the years um, and I honeymooned in you'll say this better but in Chateau Neuf de Pape <laughs> that's where I so I really taught myself to like wine and I thought I was a little bit of a connoisseur as well another false belief um, but yet a lot of it is marketing, isn't it? And I think we've got to remember that. And then when we're looking back at the good times that we had, we often look back with rose tinted glasses. Um, rose and, you, tinted. Rose, <laughs> rose, rose, rose. Another false belief. I thought people that drank rose didn't know what Millie they were Gooch. talking about. Yeah, I said I'll stop <laughs> But um, yeah, that's something to think about, isn't it? Um, there was something else as well. Oh, about false beliefs. My false belief, more than being about alcohol, was actually about sobriety. So all the false mm. things that I thought about that, like I thought if I was to give up drinking, not, I'd be boring. I might still be. <laughs> I am not. But, but yeah, things like that, I thought it'd be boring, it'd make me sad, it'd make me less confident. It, when we do the workplace presentations, we always get people to start with what their idea is about drunk and what they think about the word sober. And it's really interesting, isn't it, Alex, what comes up? And yeah. that's really good to get you thinking about what all the false beliefs are. Yeah, anyway, that was that. <laughs> I guess, uh, and I suppose, Scott, this is um, one maybe for you to um, uh, expand on a little bit, but some people are probably listening to this thinking, well, that's all very well. I can deconstruct this belief and say, well, I can't have fun without drinking. Yeah, there's been occasions where I I did have fun and I didn't drink. Or I mean, I drank every day for over 20 years. So I, yeah. I'd have to go back to when I was like 13 years old, which I can't yeah. even remember. Mm -hmm. So for me, I felt like there was a little bit of a leap of faith of, well, I'm going to see how that is. And I'm going to have some real world experiences to form those new beliefs. What, how, what would you say to someone who's maybe thinking that, that, well, I can't even find that evidence? 
Yeah, that's an awesome question. So one of the things that we do with the turnaround, so I know we'd mentioned earlier, I think William mentioned that sometimes the, the turnaround is the complete opposite, right? I need alcohol to have fun. I don't need alcohol to have fun. But a lot of times there's not sufficient evidence for that. You know, like you said, Simon, like, you know, look at, pretend you're in a courtroom, you know, um, there might not be evidence to say, oh yeah, I can always have fun without alcohol, right? But <clears throat> maybe that turnaround is I'm open to exploring this. Mm -hmm right? Maybe that turnaround is, you know what? My kids seem to have fun and they're not drinking. What are they about, right? Um, and so there are these things, I kind of call them interstitial beliefs. We, we talk about it like a ladder, you know, like the bottom rung of the ladder is I need alcohol to have fun. The very top rung of the ladder is I do not need alcohol to have fun. Um, and if you think about climbing a ladder, like you don't jump from the bottom to the top, right? There's going to be steps along the way. So maybe instead of the opposite, it can be something like, I'm learning to have fun without alcohol, right? And if you look at what that belief does to your behavior, as opposed to I need alcohol to have fun, right? If you, uh, you know, think about that social engagement, you can walk into it with a feeling of, all right, I'm learning how to do this, as opposed to, oh, this is going to be awful because I know I need alcohol, but I can't drink. Does that make sense, Simon? Yeah, that makes complete sense. And uh, yeah, and you do, you form so many new absolute true beliefs as you kind of go on the journey and they just sort of okay. solidify but i think it's important you've got to be completely honest with yourself as you go forward dave you yeah i was gonna say scott that when i first gave up drinking i mean i was drinking for 40 years so everything i did was you know with a few of them to give me confidence and i was asked um to do a talk in a pub and it was um called bravery and belonging and uh, i've been sober for nine weeks so one, it was hard initially to be in a pub I'm to sure. do this talk. Two, I wasn't used to public speaking. And three, I was never used to doing anything like that without a drink. And I went upstairs to this pub and everyone was drinking. I was sitting there thinking, how the hell am I going to go up there and do this 10 minute, well, it's 15 minute talk about my, my new sobriety. And... I got up there and once I'd done this talk, I thought that was a real step forward for me to be able to do something without the alcohol, you know. And now um, I love doing it. I, I revel in that adrenaline that I get without that, that numbing thing, you know, and, and I just love to do it. And it's, it's incredible how quickly you can adapt to not having alcohol. And, and I just find the more you do things like that, the more confidence you get. And uh, yeah, it's interesting. That's, that's climbing up the ladder, right? Uh, that's one of those times. And that's where, you know, you're, as you gather more evidence, right, you can take that next step, whatever, you know, wherever it leads you. And I think one of the things that's important is that the, you're, you have an open mind about it, right? Like maybe, maybe Dave, you would have hated doing that, you know? And in which case you're yeah. like, all right, well, that's, that's fine. I don't want to do that right now. Um, and that's such a key thing is that like, like with the approach of just being curious, and seeing seeing what comes back at us. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, Mandy. Yeah, I think it's a really important point because um, it's building new evidence, isn't it? And and then you can have something to compare it to. You know, it's like for me, weddings were one of the worst things for me for my drinking. You know, like open bar, mm. people I don't know, that, like social anxiety, maybe ex boyfriends. You know, that weird kind of mix of people you never really know. And those were some of my still the hardest for me not to get you know to get over my shame are those those wedding experiences where I was absolutely inebriated and so you know going into my first sober wedding it was like okay this is like big I don't want that I definitely don't want to do that but this is terrifying and then I did it you know and like and dancing in heels when you're not drunk and you can really dance and you know and it took yeah I like really good <laughs> yeah you know, like those, I took, a, you know, I had a couple of good friends that were there, like supporting me, like, come on, Mandy, you want to dance? And I was like, no, I don't, no, I don't, no, I'm on you can, you know, so it's really important to have support. But once I got through it, and actually I did see an ex-boyfriend, and I was really honest with him, and he was not nice to me in the past, you know, and I spoke my truth, and if I'd been drinking, I would have, like, hated myself, because, oh my God, I can't believe I spoke to him that and oh, um, but it needed to be said and, and so walking out of that you know and waking up in the morning that feeling was so overwhelmingly 
incredible and powerful that was just like, I can do this, like I can do it. And so once you've had that experience, then that's so powerful to build on for the next thing you're going to do, you know, mm -hmm. a holiday. You're like, well, I did a wedding, so I can give a holiday a go. And it's that kind of like just buying, as you say. Um, Alex. It's just to add to that really, Mandy, because you've just made me think of a, a, another example where as a child, I used to stand up on my school stage and sing my heart and never be bothered never be bothered at all you'd get the usual nerves dry mouth a little bit of fear but i'd do it then it got to singing karaoke yeah I, i'm sorry I, admit I was a karaoke singer but then it got to sing <laughs> with a few drinks and actually when you're not when you're not drinking like to excess I, it gets <clears throat> to do it. so that's straight away where that belief of you know what i'm not nervous singing in front of people when I've had a drink when i've had alcohol comes in did um, a sober ho my first sober holiday and sang on karaoke both together and nerves it was like being back at school I did sh I did get nervous but I have to say after I'd done it the the joy that I felt of doing it far weighed the need for the confidence to do it and it just felt like I was a kid again I was so proud of myself and so pleased that I'd done it and I didn't need to look at the screen i was engaging with the audience i was kind of slurring and making a fool of myself i was completely present and i was doing it i was so excited and i just thought you know just as you've said it's it is it's like being a child again and taking yourself through those baby steps to get to the place where i would flinch next time i wouldn't flinch next time i had to do that so it is all about your sober firsts as well isn't it yeah yeah that Kate. I forgot what I was going to say there. <laughs> Just talk uh, about your glasses about... and skulls and how awesome. <laughs> I was going to say, I love your glasses, Kate. Hey, yeah, very, okay, very you've got great taste. taste. Uh, um, hello. It was about... Dave, yours are very nice too. <laughs> it was about the, the whole, I'm still thinking about the evidence collecting. And I know, I, I sort of tend to, we talk about this on the podcast, about putting everything through the sobriety filter. Because I don't know if there's, there's some people out there who, I'm like a real big overthinker. So something about this, okay, examine the thoughts, examine the beliefs, can get me in sticky water because then I can think myself down a cul-de-sac. Mm. So there's a couple of things like that. So one thing I always said is like put every test every theory like you're putting it through a sober filter. If it conflicts with a sober filter, chuck it out for a bit because otherwise you might get yourself your knickers in a twist. On one of these things, like this might seem a bit strange, but one of these float I call them floaty concepts that float around and you like you were saying, you just assume that they're true. And there was this some floaty concept about moderation being mm. the holy grail of all of our behavior. And when I started thinking about that, so then obviously it goes back to Aristotle. And it was basically, he was talking about emotions. He wasn't talking about having an, a poisonous carcinogenic substance that's going to numb out and dirty drug all of your neurotransmitters but i took that as a reason i was like, oh well it, oh it was ever so extreme not to drink it'd be much better if i was just perfectly grown uply moderate about this but put it through the sobriety filter that it's bullshit isn't it and the other thing that i i helped me is someone said to me don't trust what you think trust what you know right so again i went okay okay what do i know like deep down i know this is fucking me up like really badly i can think what i like about it i can have all the in 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 and i know and i know i turned up for this whatever i bought this book because i knew i had a problem I turned up to this coaching hall because I kind of knew it was time to call it a day. So I think that there's other, those kinds of other things that you can employ to cut through some of the radio noise. Do you, does that make any sense? Yeah, totally. You reminded me, Dan Harris has a book uh, called 10% Happier. I'm sure a lot of you have probably read it. Um, and the very first line in that book made me laugh out loud because the whole book starts with this sentence. The voice in my head is an asshole. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I love that. 
Uh, Catherine's just said on Facebook, what she found surprising in sobriety is it really is the company you're in and nothing to do with the booze. Um, massive misconception in our society there. And I think, um, I remember somebody saying to me, you know, when we have, for, when you look back at your holidays and you see these pictures of cocktails in with the sun and the sea and the sand, mm. and we give all the credit to that drink. And we forget that about the sun and the sea and the sand <laughs> and the view and the people that we were with and all the pictures have like cocktails in it. It's ridiculous, isn't it? Sorry, that have nothing to do with what you were talking about as such. But... Well, just <laughs> on that same topic, kind of about a belief. I mean, I mentioned this um, briefly, so sorry if I'm repeating myself, when we talked about social events. But since I quit, I've been to two weddings you know one of them I was a kind of guest who was making up the numbers the other one was a really really good friend I didn't drink at both of them one of them was crap because I hardly knew anybody and the other one we had an amazing time and it just formed the truth around that belief that an event is good or bad because of the people the event itself and those sort of things the alcohol it would have still been crap if i'd drunk and the other one would have still been good i just would have been pissed as well and simple you know scott you've got oh sorry so i was just going to ask scott quickly i know you've sort of shared a a, i don't want to give you giving tactics all the time but i love what you say about sort of visualization before people go out socially and we were talking social events last week Oh, yeah. What do you recommend for that? So here's a cool thing. Your brain can't necessarily tell the difference between a very, very detailed visualization and an actual event. So if you sit down and spend some time like thinking about an event, say it's a wedding. Guys, I'm actually going to a wedding tonight on Facebook. It's kind of sad. My cousin's getting married and they were supposed to get married, but I'm glad I'm going to be there. So anyway, um, but if you sit down and you think about going to this wedding, um, what I recommend people do is like go through the whole thing. Think about getting ready. Think about getting in your car, right? What are you wearing? What are your part? What's your partner wearing? What are your kids wearing? What whoever's going to be there with you, right? Think about driving to the place. Think about getting out of the car. Maybe you know first you go into a church and then you go to a reception hall. But just work your way through the whole night. Try to visualize everything, right? What does it look like? Um, and as you do that, you'll start to notice emotions come up. It's really fantastic, and you'll start to see these emotions come up, and that is giving you a little bit of a preview of what's going to happen. Right. And so as you think through this stuff, as you do this stuff, you can then visualize yourself going through the whole night without alcohol. Right. You can visualize, you know, Uncle Bob trying to bring you a beer five times and you saying, please stop. Right. How does that feel? And it's a really cool thing, because once you've kind of gone through it in that way, it's kind of like what you're talking about, Simon, is like you're, you're getting evidence, even though you haven't actually done it. So visualization is super, super powerful in trying to shift this stuff, especially right before a big event that you're nervous about. Yeah. And to the extent I used to write it down in my journal before I went and then I'd kind of compare the notes the next day of, well, how did the visualization look against what actually yeah. happened? And often it was pretty accurate. So except for, you know, like the price of the drinks and stuff like that. But right. <laughs> Mandy, did you have your hand up? A yeah, I just uh, wanted to uh, come back to what Kate was saying about moderation being the Holy Grail, because I think that's probably key and part of everybody's sober journey is this, this concept that, we, you know, we failed if we can't moderate. Um, and so, you know, we get so far and we have this sort of feeling inside us that we think that then it's not working for us, but we, you know, it's not like, okay, let's get rid of it. It's like, okay, let's work really hard at keeping it in, yeah. but in a small amount. Um, and um, certainly I had that about being a parent that I thought that it was part, you know, I had this belief that part of being a parent was drinking moderately or trying to drink moderately. So my, I could model moderate alcohol intake for my kids. Um, and, you know, what's such a wonderful kind of um, discovery is the, the, the choice that I've now given my kids. Like they're, they're, my husband drinks, I don't they have just a choice about it to have a conversation and think about it. And that is such a kind of better um, modeling behavior than, than moderating or trying to moderate because it was never possible anyway. So um, I think that will resonate with a lot of people, you know, and it's like 
just because it's normalized in society and it's hugely, hugely important and makes a lot of money for companies and is in every series we watch, every right. you know, kind of film we watch, um, it doesn't mean that it is kind of normal to drink alcohol and you're not abnormal if you just choose to not drink. And um, so, yeah, I just wanted to throw that in because it definitely... I totally agree. I think we all probably tried moderation and it just yeah. didn't work out for us. It's like part of the journey. And I just found it was, it was just decision after decision after decision. And then the easiest route was actually making one decision never to drink yeah. again. Like, I, I wouldn't mind asking William actually, like what's the, like maybe there's some science behind moderation or like your thoughts around, to me it was a painful experience, but. I, yeah, it, so, so if we go back again to the basic physiology that when a drink wears off, you have an unpleasant anxious feeling. Okay, so that's the alcohol withdrawal. Now the quickest way to get rid of that feeling is to have another drink. Okay, so that's a sort of, that's a conscious thing, but your subconscious, your subconscious works by cause and effect. And if you keep doing the same thing, um, you will keep doing, so for example, a, a, a sort of an easy example that most people can relate to is driving. So when you drive, you, right, you use your right foot to slow the vehicle down. Then if you're in a passenger seat and someone's driving too fast or driving too fast with the vehicle in front, you find your right leg keeps tensing. And all that, that's, that's an automated reaction because your brain over however long you've been driving for has received the message that if you tense your right leg, the vehicle slows down. Okay. Now it works by cause and effect. So how addictive a drug is, is not necessarily to do with the drug. It's to do with how quickly it ends up in your bloodstream. We feel the effects of a drug when it hits our bloodstream. Okay, the quickest way to feel the effect of the drug is to inject it into your veins. It's straight in there. Okay, inhaling it, it goes into your lungs and then straight into the bloodstream there. It takes a second or two and snorting it. I can't remember. It's a few seconds more because alcohol, because we drink it, it can take up to 20 minutes to go through our stomach, through the intestine and into the blood. Okay, so an element of addiction is when you're, you subconsciously associate the, with the taking more of the drug to relieve the withdrawal, okay? So the quicker the effect is felt, the quicker you, you associate it. So with cigarettes, you have a cigarette, you have that withdrawal from it, you have another cigarette. As you're smoking it, you can feel the withdrawal being relieved, so you very quickly become addicted. Alcohol takes a lot longer to become addicted purely because it takes longer to go into your bloodstream. OK, that's why so many people can moderate. It's not that they don't have a withdrawal. It's just they don't associate with taking another dose of the drug to relieve that withdrawal. So someone who sits there and says, oh, I only have one glass of wine a night. They have the withdrawal, but it would just never dawn on them that that unpleasant feeling that from one glass is going to be almost negligible. But they would never associate it with drinking and they would certainly never associate it on a subconscious level with having another drink to get rid of it. Now, the problem is when you know something, you can't unknow it. OK, so for anyone who gets to the stage where they are associating another drink with getting rid of the withdrawal, that's game over as far as moderation goes. It's just a painful and ultimately fruitless uh, purpose because all you're doing is every time that alcoholic drink wears off, you will want another one. And as you said yourself, the, the, there's a very easy way out of it, and that's to stop. But you can, it, it's a one-way street, basically. When you've gone down it, you can stop for one year, 10 years, 20 years. But as soon as that drink wears off, you'll be looking for the next one to get rid of that withdrawal. That's it's a really tough explanation. Sorry, think, Scott, go on. Oh, no, I was going to say, I, I love that, William, because, um, you know, people coming into programs with this naked mind, I, moderation is a very, I'm sure you guys have all seen this, it is a huge topic. Everyone <laughs> wants to moderate, um, which I totally get. Um, and I, I've been there too, you know, and I, and I understand that. But with that association, it gets hard. So we talk about like, yeah, I always like to say alcohol is addictive to humans, like period, that's it. Um, and you know, if you go far enough down the road, like you mentioned it, there's no, you can't really turn around. So when people say to me, oh, I really want to learn to moderate, I'm going to say, all right, but like, we have to, first of all, get you some alcohol free time first, right? So that you can be in that headspace. And then I talk to them as we're going through that. 
And that desire for moderation very often starts uncovering some other beliefs. Why do I want to moderate? Oh, it's because I'm going to have more fun. And it's amazing for, to me to see how when they explore that, you know, on their own, they start to come up with these other reasons why moderation is important to them. And then a lot of times people will start one of our programs wanting to moderate and then end being like, yeah, I don't, I don't know if I do. You know, I can think of, you know, uh, there are people who've like, who have gone through, at least through our programs that like have successfully moderated and are still doing it. Um, but the vast majority of people that come in and say, I want to moderate, they're past that point you were talking about, William. And, um, you know, it's hard. It's hard. I think it's hard for a lot of people to accept it. Yeah, I, I agree. And uh, I felt like I was, I think a lot of at the start, you just, you feel like you're losing something when actually you're gaining everything and you, but you just don't see it at the beginning. I just saw that Ashley asked a question and I really wanted to read it out. And yeah, I was just going to say it's Simon. God. <laughs> but I know Ashley. So I've just, and she's doing amazing on uh, her own journey. She said, any advice on having your first sober gathering? I, I don't know whether to ask Kate this cause she'll just say, tell everyone to piss off. But, so <laughs> any, Sober gathering at your own house, house. party. Dinner parties. <laughs> so, so Ashley's quit, but there's going to be a gathering, maybe a sober gathering, maybe people. Yeah, actually, how you know how to deal with it when everyone else is drinking? People are coming to her house, obviously after lockdown. What advice would we give? So Dave's got his hand up for that one. Well, I've had plenty of this because I used to like stock up for. Sorry, Kate, house parties, gatherings on a Sunday. And uh, my wife used to say to me, oh, I'll, I'll go shopping and get, get the drink for this afternoon. And I'll say, actually, I'll go because she would get a normal amount, like a couple of bottles of wine and some beers. And I would get a case of red, case of white, case of Prosecco, loads of beers in that, just so I could justify my own drinking. So when I actually stopped drinking, I found everyone else moderated because I was a feeder. But um, what I did, I made sure I had enough of my own drinks to um, have that day. Alcohol-free beers, no secco, whatever it's called, and that. And just plan yourself. You know, Simon, like we talk about the sober toolbox, where you have to plan ahead and make yeah. sure that you're okay. And, and, and it's not the trigger of... You know, there's um, a kombucha out now, real kombucha, and they do three. Uh, and one's like, uh, and of course it doesn't suit everyone because alcohol-free drinks can be a trigger as well. I must say that. But if you're okay with it, there's so many different varieties of drinks out there and you could even be a bit clever and make a mocktail. And I mean, Alex, what do you do in this situation? Do you make a big deal out? I won't ask Kate. But Alex, no, go on. Lisa, I've, I've got some ideas your... actually because I, I still do most and I do Kate. still socialise. <laughs> I think Kate might be give some awesome ideas on this because okay. I think one of Ashley's concerns is that these people are never going to go home. They're going to be there till three in the morning. I'm not drinking. <laughs> I can hear them from my bedroom. They're pissing me off. Yeah. How do you know do what we do every Christmas? We host a party and we're, we've got musicians. So we host it in the afternoon. Um, we give some idea about when we're thinking of wrapping up. Doing it in the afternoon is a, a good thing. Um, and also there's food. Um, I put my husband in charge of anything alcoholic. I have loads of alcohol free alternatives and we have a focus. So we do music. We print out loads of sheets of music and we all get it's like a massive people bring instruments and we and we do stuff. I, I very rarely socialize not with a theme or with doing stuff because I find it too boring. So um, the other thing I did, I hosted a, 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 a my birthday party and we've got a big bell tent up in the garden and I made it like a fairy feast. So I had like tea on chi real china and loads of cakes and all the kids were running around and it was beautiful. I took loads of photos because I thought, well, if I can, if I've got something to do as well, I can, if, if I've got a sort of an artistic kind of little project in the back of my head, it means that I, if I get bored, I can just focus on that. <laughs> Sounds awful, doesn't it? Because I have really got awesome friends, to be honest. <laughs> I actually do like hanging out with. It's just I've got to do a few things to make it my introvert, my, my introvert not utterly miserable after a couple of hours. So, so that would be my, those would be my tips. Yeah, and I suppose don't make it all about the booze. Just because everyone else is drinking, you can still 
do other things. Mm. Like Millie Gooch said last week, be in charge of the playlist on Spotify. You know, yeah. you could take control yeah. of the music, create some games. And, but I suppose like with social events, I always say to people have an exit plan just if it gets too much. And if it's at your house, you, you can't exit really, unless you flee the house. Yeah. Go on, Alex. No, I was just going to say actually over time um, at the beginning, and I think I'm the newest sober out of us. So at the very beginning for me, there's no way I would have been able to have people drinking around me. There's just no way. I mean, my husband gave up and said, I will give up for a year to help you. And that's how much it would have bothered me to even watch him have a can. So I, I completely get where Ashley's coming from. But over time, and certainly now, I could quite comfortably host a party and actually pour other people drinks and not want one. And I think that comes when you find your sober legs and you actually gain confidence in your own ability to not want to drink. And then, you know, most of you know me now. I'm quite blatant and I just say, get the fuck out of my house. I've had enough of you all. But, <laughs> <laughs> but then I suppose the thing... Just to, on from that, I'm um, sorry, Lisa, Lisa. Sorry. Yeah, just to go on from that, what if your husband didn't want to change his ways? What if he wanted to carry on? Like, where do we go with that? Um, I, I, <laughs> right, there we go. Well, I, know this, I know that not everybody's in that position with me. And I've said this to you before, and I say this with absolute kind of conviction. I am a control freak. He knew that when he married me. He doesn't do as he's told, don't get me wrong. There's no thumbprint on his head. But he knows my personality. And he knew if I was going to stop drinking, he would have to do it. My relationship <laughs> survived. It, would, it wouldn't have survived. That's not the case for everybody, which is probably why you need to move to Mandy quickly. <laughs> All right, let's go to Mandy. Lisa, we'll come back to you in a sec there. Go on, Mandy. Um, well, there's, I think, I mean, it's been a long, long process. I'll say that. Like, it wasn't easy. It's, there's been moments where it wasn't easy. And it was about, like, really finding my voice. And, and quite often I would go back to drinking because I... I found it so hard to be around people that were drunk. So it was about me finding my voice and setting some boundaries around it. You know, for example, if he's going out with his mates and if he's going to come out, you know, pissed, he's going to come back pissed, he sleeps on the sofa and that's like things like that I wouldn't have done before. I would have like suffered in bed next to him, like him blackout drunk, like, Whoa, and me like just like <laughs> frightened and just hoping that, you know, I can sleep a little bit. And um, so I, I, it took a lot of confidence to kind of get my voice and be like, you know, this is actually not OK. And so the, the sort of two main things I have is like he's it's not OK for him to be drunk around the kids. And it's not OK for me to, because I'm an insomniac and I don't sleep very much anyway. It's not OK for him to affect my sleep. So that's basically it. And so other than that, and, and he, you know, to be honest, at the beginning, it was challenge there were a few challenging times but he definitely drinks way way less now and it's kind of petered off naturally that and he's more conscientious about it because it's like well okay yeah I can see that the kids have grown up we're having open conversations about alcohol so he can't get away with it in the in the way that he would have done in the past because they're like kind of aware of it as well so I think some strong boundaries for you, like self-protect or sobriety. That's what I was going to say to that, that woman as well. It's like, do you really want to host a party right now? Like maybe it, there is something to say, like, not, no, I'm not going to do that at the moment. You know, have lunch, have them around for lunch or not at all, but protect your sobriety. And yeah, just a few sort of key rules and discuss. Cause I didn't ask, you know, I didn't, everything was up. I was getting angry with him, but I wasn't explaining why. And so when you kind of actually say like, this is my bottom line, um, you know, and, and some relationships don't survive it, but you know, we're out the other side and it's fine. He, he does his thing <laughs> and I don't, you know, so. But those boundaries are so important. And I think, you know, it does take a bit of courage to step up and actually be able to say, look, I'm not okay with this. It's, it's not working for me. And, you know, I think in most cases partners are supportive and they they want to do all they can to help but it, yeah it's not always the case I, we can't sugarcoat it every time can no. we Lisa what were you going to say earlier sorry mine was just about that lady and um, inviting people around these to pre-warn people let them know that it might not be like it used to be because I think about this time last year I hosted a garden party and I kind of had to tell everybody, look, it's not because I've, I've got a bar in my garden. <laughs> 
<laughs> so it used to have optics on everything. It's now a coffee bar. So I invited quite a few friends round, but I did let them know that it would be very different because like you, Dave, I was a feeder. So I would stock that bar up. It would have everything in it. Um, so when people did come round, it was very different and it was lovely and it was shorter. Um, but I think if you just let them know beforehand and, you know, like, and let ask them to bring what they want to drink. Because I said I, I was really quite strict on that, is I won't be going to the shop buying alcohol because of the marketing and how mad it made me. I'm not going buying it. So if you want it and you want it in my house, you buy it. <laughs> yeah. Is that a bit tight? <laughs> no, not tight than forcing your husband into stopping with you, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> uh, do, you know, do you know what, Lisa? Um, I went shopping the other day because um, there's all these queues uh, to get in. So I said to him, do you want a bottle of wine? And she said, okay then. And I wanted to say to the cashier, it's not for me. Yeah, I, did, <laughs> drinking. Yeah. I felt so, so bloody awful buying the wine. I just wanted to justify that I'm not drinking it it's funny isn't it i did the same with smoking when i stopped smoking there is no way if some you know like if i was going to because obviously i'd not stopped drinking then so if i was going to parties and somebody would say oh can you pick me 20 cigarettes up i'd be like no that's weird i've stopped because i'm, I'm awkward about it so i wouldn't buy them either. yeah Scott's had his hand up yeah, no, I actually, I wanted to, thank you, Mandy. I wanted to comment on something that you said, because this idea of like being at a party around drunk people, um, <clears throat> I did this. So within two weeks of quitting drinking, I had to give a presentation uh, a lot like Dave was talking about. Um, and it was at this, whatever. I used, to, I used to be in an industry where we used to have these conventions and we had really fancy Chateau Frontenac in Quebec City, like gorgeous place. Um, and there's always the cocktail hour at the end of the day. And I was so nervous because I was two weeks in um, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And now normally in that situation, I was also in sales. So normally in that situation, I would have found someone to hang out with so I could have a couple of drinks before I went in to have more drinks. So I was social and, and talking and everything. So I wasn't able to do that. So what I decided to do going into it was to observe people and actually watch very, there are very few things that help me shift my belief as much as that. Because I walked into this thing, I got there early, right? So before people were like starting and there were some key people that I needed to talk to, you know, again, trying to do some business before people, you know, got too into it. And it was amazing to me when I wasn't drinking, watching how quickly everything shifted, how quickly I got bored, how quickly I was like, this is a gigantic waste of time and money. So I just wanted to put a reframe on that party idea. I know it's tough when they're in your house and there's a lot of stuff there, but it's also a real opportunity when we're around people who are doing this because you can actually see, you know, I talk about like physically people change after the first drink. You don't necessarily yeah. notice it when you're doing, when you're drinking yourself, but you will see like facial expressions change. People start leaning back, like all types of stuff happens. So bringing the curiosity to that experience too, and just being like, how, like, wow, do I want to be like that is, can be really powerful. Can I, mm. Sorry, I will shut up, but I just want to pick up on something because I, I suffer from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. And I know a lot of people that develop problems with alcohol do have some trauma in their, their background. And I do think that's part of the reason why I carried on drinking and part of the reason why a lot of people do carry on drinking is the fact that it's quite terrifying to be around people that are drunk you know yeah. and so that thing especially when you love people like your family your friends your your partner and that change even subtle changes in behavior are extremely triggering you know and that's why you know every time I would kind of be like I'm doing this for me I'm doing this for me and then I'd be in situations and I'd be like I'm just gonna you know I it was too terrifying to be around that and to yeah to to sort of deal with those changes um when you need people to be who that they're, they're supposed to be to keep you safe um and i know that there's a lot of people that develop problems with alcohol that have trauma so just be aware of that and i guess that comes back to sort of who you spend your time with especially at the beginning you know and it like now it's okay and i and i have my safe people and i you know and i do tend to sort of uh, socialize with sober people but some of my mates I'm absolutely fine if they're drunk because I trust them anyway it's intrinsic but 
there might be people around you where you just don't feel that great about them, but you've mm -hmm. been socially in contact with them for such a long time you don't realise. And, and so, you know, protect your sobriety, protect yourself and just, you know, be aware that that might be something that's coming up for you. And perhaps, you know, a shift in how you socialise with people could really be, you know, something in terms of looking after yourself. So I just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, thanks for that, Mandy. I, I'm going to move on to something slightly different, but I just wanted to acknowledge what you, you said there as well, because it's a really important point, I think. Um, and I was going to go back to the evidence collecting for, um, for shifting beliefs. And I was going to say, don't forget to collect the evidence the morning after, because that's really great. <laughs> and I do believe that um, I coined the phrase Chardonnay Freuder, which is like Schadenfreude, when you are delighting in the misery of other people's misery delighting and the misery of other people's hangovers it's chardonnay freud and that is you can see it so you know like maybe even a text how you doing how you doing this morning what are you up to <laughs> and watch them go oh my god i'm hanging so you know it's like that, that's your moment that's your moment to grab it and revel and don't feel bad being smug i really believe that just I know I'm a bitch, but you know. Uh, <laughs> okay, something similar to that. You know, when your friends, when I was early um, sober and people want to catch up with you and you don't want to go anymore, um, I would always offer them to go for a really early morning walk if they wanted to catch up with me. <laughs> so they'd be like, oh, you're not coming out anymore. And I'm like, you know what? Why don't we go for a walk at like 8 o'clock Saturday morning and we can have a real good catch up? <laughs> and you'd be like, oh. yeah. <laughs> Can, it, can I just go back to what somebody said on Facebook? Because I don't, I don't want it to come across that we've just kind of brushed over it. And I know we have talked in detail, but somebody said here that they're not lucky enough for their partner to actually cut down or, any, or be supportive at all. And I just want to go back to what I said. They were my boundaries, my rules, my experiences. And, and I'm not suggesting for one minute that anybody should walk out on somebody if it's <laughs> the way it works for me. And I'm lucky in that way. But you, you need to kind of decide what your rules are and what you're going to accept during your sobriety. And Mandy touched on it before, you must protect your sobriety over everything. That's not our decision to make for you. You know, I, I, I honestly, genuinely would not have been able to get sober without my husband doing what he did for the year. You know, but then now I would have no problem in, in him having a drink now. It, it's just getting to that point, I think, sometimes. Um, Mandy's obviously set her own boundaries and rules and had a cooperative partner to do that with. We, we do acknowledge as a panel that that's not the case for everybody and some people find it incredibly difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Well, can I just say, yeah, because I, I mean, I've told this story before. I might have even told it on here, but, you know, I didn't tell my husband because, you know, like so many people, the stories got mixed up in the, the bindweed of alcohol had wound its tentacles around everything you know and so slowly slowly had to snip all of those associations and you know and so because you know i dated my husband drinking i got pissed at our wedding you know blah blah blah, blah you know all the way through and and i was really i was really nervous i was really scared about what that would mean for us you know once again you know well now i think back to it i, I feel a bit sad i was like i sold a short and i really bigged up the alcohol because that's where where it had got to with me it was was that center stage for me and um and so i didn't i didn't say anything for about about three weeks i joined soberistas and i was like i'm gonna do this because i knew he was fed up of me going on about every weekend i go oh, i'm never drinking again and he'd be like oh shut up you know and so i i just i i saw it as like mine i was like this is mine and if it's mine then no one can wobble it you know I didn't want his support I didn't want him to to ha to to quit with me because I thought well if you fall off the wagon you're gonna drag me off with you and I just thought I better tell him after about three weeks of being online when I was never online before because I thought he's gonna think I'm having an affair so I was like no I really have to, <laughs> I have to fess up here right and I did I said look I, I haven't drunk for three weeks I really am doing it and it was something about me reporting it historically with a bit of evidence again so much about evidence 
distance, he was just like, oh, you know, fair play, you know, fair play to you. And what, and what he did is he just stopped um, having wine in the house because I didn't really know how to ask for support. So I didn't. And I was like, no, no, I don't want you to change because I was scared of everyone changing. It was like, you know, I was, I was like, no, 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 because that's really too bad for everyone. Um, now I'm less apologetic, I have to say. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, so he just stopped drinking wine that was very triggering to me so he went he drinks cider and so maybe there's some like little compromises along the way just to say look i do need a bit of support but i don't want you to change i don't see it as your problem this is something that i'm doing that's just again a, a, a possible and and there might just be some tweaks to be made to mean that you're less you know triggered scott you've got something to say on yeah. that one I just want to say this fantastic point. And it's like Mandy brought up about the idea of like going to events, like there's boundaries you get to draw for yourself. Um, and I think that's something that a lot of us kind of lose uh, with drinking. Yeah. And so there's this idea now of like, all right, I do have to draw these boundaries. Like, how am I going to act at home? Am I going to go to that gathering? Am I going to have that party? Right. And those seem can seem like some really big, uh, big decisions to make. And so, you know, like Alex, I was, uh, I was lucky. My wife just, was like, oh, you're quitting? I'll just, I won't drink around you. Um, and now she doesn't drink at all. It just like, she kind of like came in that direction. And, um, but you know, there were certain friends where I had to draw those boundaries. Like I didn't go, I didn't go to the bar right away. You know, I will now, I'll go out and hang out with my friends. I'll have one or two rounds. I leave before they get past that because it's just not fun. Um, but actually thinking about that and thinking about like, all right, what are my boundaries here? And actually having a really open, as, as honest of a conversation as you can with your partner is, is difficult, but so important in this process. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from uh, Ash in the, in the Facebook group. It says, hi, I'm newly sober, 130 days. I'd say that's pretty amazing. That's so awesome. well yeah. not you. Um, <laughs> I'm struggling to find a way to tell my lad friends about my newfound sobriety as our friendship group has predominantly revolved around alcohol, pub culture and nights out since we were teenagers. Any suggestions how to tell them without coming across as judgy stroke pompous? Who wants to tell that one? Dave! <laughs> yeah. Go on Dave. Yeah, I think you should answer that Dave. He's talking lad friends. <laughs> Not that you like, haven't uh, got lab well, friends, I, I'm just saying that. <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> but my friends well, are girls. I'm the granddaddy of the group, aren't I? So a lot of people like a bit older and they, they were like really, I'm 72, you know. <laughs> um, they, um, so I'm mad. Um, no, uh, it was for me, I just like literally um, told them and I didn't give, I didn't really care what they thought, to be honest. I said, look, my body and mind has had enough alcohol now, unless I do something about it, I'm, you'll be coming to my funeral in about a year. But for someone else, I think sometimes, I, I don't think the I'm on antibiotics thing works. I think if you just say look, I'm giving myself a bit of a rest for, for a moment, keep it small to start rather than make the big announcement. Because especially for the guys, it's like, what, what, what's wrong with you? Have another drink and you feel under pressure. And then you might, you know, if you keep it small and just say, look, I'm just going to have a month off because I, I, I'm on a health regime or fitness thing. Uh, and, and just uh, after that, you can say, actually, it's really working for me. I feel great. So I'm going to carry it on, you know. Just for me, that's advice I would give is uh, unless you know your friends really, really well and you can have that heart to heart with them and individually otherwise I, I just feel like you might be under too much pressure and for me if I was younger I, I might have caved in if they were going to say to me go on son have a beer what's wrong with you and I might have gone I'll go on then but I think I think you need to set your own boundaries first and, and almost come up with a, a default thing to say in advance just otherwise you're going to be putting yourself under a lot of pressure yeah, and I also you might. I think you might. I found those kind of boozy nights out just didn't appeal anymore. Anyway, I thought I liked them, and then I actually didn't. And you might find that they're not quite as appealing as they once were. I mean, you'd have, although where you are over a hundred days, you you might already be thinking that. So if you're feeling a sense of actually, I don't really fancy that. Maybe embrace the joy of missing out instead of the fear of missing out. But. I don't know. Who, who else wants to... Oh, I Mandy. A, I had a conversation with a client about this the other day. And, you know, it's a, 
it's like no one needs to know the dark story like no one needs to know the problem like you can frame it just like you know um yeah i've given up drinking it's amazing like i'm i'm doing loads of sport like i feel really good and um, you know it just i just didn't wasn't enjoying it anymore and that's enough like i think we have we talked about this before didn't we you have this tendency yeah. to sort of roll out our whole story and you know just keep it positive and just um yeah keep keep the information to a minimum i think yeah exactly my it's like my video why we need to think like vegans you know you see someone who's vegan it's a lifestyle choice they're not crying in the corner because they can't have meat can't have dairy they're like super passionate they're excited about what they've done and it's like, that's how i am about sobriety it's like it's a lifestyle but you're not but you're not it's not such a big deal now anyway when someone says no. that you're not fine five years All ago it was so much, yeah. but now yeah and, and i think it's going to get more and more what does like, say? Yeah, I like what he says that he just because I'm right in saying I, 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 I haven't don't I haven't told everybody that um you yeah. you don't drink and you just say no I don't fancy one thanks and that's that. Yeah, um, I think with mates they will smell weakness. <laughs> 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 if you have anything other than just something simple and direct, they will start taking the Mickey and having a go at you. But if you literally just say, you know what, I don't fancy drinking tonight it cuts things dead and your mates will take the piss but if you as i say if you cut it dead and just keep it simple the conversation will move on pretty quickly anyway and what i personally found i kind of thought going out not drinking it's like this massive thing and it's like oh my god what's it going to be like going to the pub with my mates and not drink and actually it's exactly the same <laughs> Nothing. You, you make it out to be much bigger than it is and also i suppose we're all slightly egotistic you think you're going to go there and you're going to be the topic of conversation all night <laughs> because you're not drinking. But actually, your mates have got their own concerns and their own things, and you, the conversation will move on. And especially when they're drinking, because when people drink, they become increasingly incapable of paying attention to what's going on around them. They will have forgotten you're not drinking. And I had a couple of weird experiences. One of them, someone, I was talking to someone, and, and I sort of said, oh, I'm not drinking tonight. And she said, oh, but how come you're not drinking? You And... I, I'd met her after I'd stopped drinking. She's never seen me drink. <laughs> and people were saying, Aren't you not? And I was like, Good people, when they're drinking, they just assume everyone is doing the same. They don't notice. And I think that's one of the key things of being sober. I really like it. You're almost like a spy. Going back to what Scott was saying about gathering data, you're like a spy. <laughs> and half the time, unless you tell them you're not drinking, people don't even realise you're not drinking. Because when you're drunk, you never notice people more sober than you. You notice people more drunk, but you never notice people more sober than you. And if you go somewhere sober, you're like the grey man who you can get away with it. You, you don't really, it's not the big deal people think it is. Yeah, and you can, you can always use Kate's traffic light system as well, the, yeah. the red, amber and green, which I deployed when I learned <laughs> it only last week. <laughs> oh, that's a good one, yeah. Some, somebody's commented on, um, myths surrounding the morning after as well which i think is quite a good point <coughs> talking about beliefs around alcohol but beliefs around hangovers um which i think is quite important to pick up on so i, I am going to come back to you i'm afraid william because you'll do this better than i can and um yeah the, the old i'm just tired i'm not hungover i'm just tired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, i think that's yeah. another false belief isn't it yeah i think that well that comes yeah that's the whole thing of sleep being ruined and i think that the commonest symptom of a hangover is sleep. People say, I'm tired. To such an extent, people say, I'm not hungover, I'm just tired. <laughs> it's a part of tiredness. And I think that's, that's one of the worst things. And it's, So a hangover is your body telling you you're destroying it. And I think that's, that's another of our core beliefs. Now, I've got a confession to make. I, so I quit drinking. Okay, I stopped drinking. When I stopped drinking, I had this core belief about drinking. Okay, I wrote Alcohol Explained and I still had this belief about drinking. And this belief was dispelled when I was sat on a plane reading Annie Grace's book. And yes. so I'd like to hand over to Scott to debunk this one. And you <laughs> still get this all the time. And that it is, alcohol in small amounts is healthy. Oh man, yeah, that's, uh, that's amazing. So I think, first of all, uh, I can't remember who was talking about the marketing, but marketing and at least here in the States, I don't know what it's like over there, but on the news here on a very regular basis, 
there's always a story about how a glass of red wine a night is good for your heart. And I actually saw one one time about how a glass of red wine might help beat cancer when we actually know it is completely the opposite of this. Um, and so there are huge cultural myths about this, right? There are huge ideas and it comes back to, it kind of ties everything together actually, William, as I'm thinking about it, it ties together the moderation idea. It ties together this idea that like, oh, this is actually good for us. So boiling it down to like the essence of what this is, alcohol is ethanol. It's funny to me that you were on a plane because ethanol is the same shit that was in the gas tank of that. <laughs> yeah, we were arguing to ourselves that just a little bit of that, right? That's like getting out of the plane and just like opening up the gas. I don't know if there's a gas, I don't know anything about planes, but just, you know, like taking a little sip and then that's okay. Like that's an insane idea, right? But for some reason, because we've dressed it up, we've dressed it up with the marketing, we've dressed it up with the fancy umbrellas, we've dressed it up with, you know, connoisseurs talking about all these different notes and aftertastes and all this stuff, we then believe like, ah, oh, well, just a little bit can actually hurt. Now, a lot of, there's a lot of different places that this comes from. I just kind of laid some of them out there. At the end of the day, the reason that this belief can be so, uh, so harmful for us is that's how we start back down the road, right? So when we think like, oh, having a glass of wine once in a while is okay. And oh, that's actually healthy for me. You know, I want to be, I want to make sure I'm good to my heart, right? Um, that's how we end up kind of keep going. Now, there's a few different ways that I'll talk about this. One is that, you know, that as an alcohol belief, if you actually were to look at evidence of what, uh, what about someone who has a glass of wine once in a while and someone who's never drank in their life, right? Is there an, a measurable health difference? The answer is we don't actually have that data, but we kind of know it intuitively, right? We kind of know intuitively that alcohol is a poison. It doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter how expensive it is, meaning how good it is, right? It's, uh, it just, it doesn't matter. Um, secondly, it's just going through, what did it for me was going through all of the different effects, right? Going through, through how did I sleep, right? If I did just have one drink, how did I sleep? If I did just have one drink, how did I feel the next day? And more importantly than that, is a, just one drink every once in a while a possibility for me? So when I kind of put all of those things together, for me personally, that's where I was like, there's nothing healthy about this. There's nothing healthy about how I feel mentally or emotionally. There's nothing healthy about how I feel physically. Um, and so for me, it was really going back to the evidence that I gathered um, through all of that. So how did you break that, William? So I, I, yeah, that was very similar, actually. What I liked and what I think drove it home to me was what Annie Grace said is that at its simplest, alcohol is poisonous. Okay, there's no two ways about that. It kills living things and it's poisonous. Fruit, on the other hand, is good for you. It's got, it's got vitamins and minerals and all the good stuff that you actually need. Putting them together doesn't mean that alcohol is good for you. And I always say it's like, it's like me saying, like, what do you have for breakfast? Well, I get up in the morning and I smoke a packet of 10 Marlboros and have an apple. And then someone's <laughs> saying, why on earth are you doing that? And I say, well, there's vitamin C in the apple. It's good for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's brilliant. Kate, Can I say got... something? Yeah, because um, one thing that, and this comes from your book, <laughs> William, that really, really helped me, and, and the backdrop to this is, you know, again, the moderation thing. And after um, a year of not drinking, I went back to drinking. and <laughs> I, I tested it. Um, and I remember, William, th there's various ways to say this. It's basically, if you are trying really, really hard to moderate, the horse is out of the stable. What you are looking for has already gone. And as William said in his book, once it's soured, it's soured. That I'm right, you did write that, aren't you? Aren't I? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, and I found that. So after, so you know, because so my script went, oh, I've done all this self-development, I've done a year, da 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 da, da and I I had a drink, and it started the booze chatter off straight away. I was gutted. I was like, oh man, I really thought I was the one person to get away with this. I really did. I was, I really thought I was the one who was going to get away with that. And because if you are trying really hard to moderate, one will never be enough. You're not really interested in moderation. You probably not really, really, really want to get pissed, right? 
it's not it's not going to work and moderation actually once you start again you can't unsee it once you've seen it you will be hawking on yourself believe me you will be going counting the units hawking on yourself feeling like a failure yeah. not being satisfied and it's not enjoyable and it will never be enjoyable again because you'll never get enough and that doesn't mean you're an alcoholic it just means that you've passed that point I actually put in my book that people who buy sober books generally can't moderate, which is pretty much the same as what William <laughs> said. It's you know, true, I, right? Lisa, accept, Lisa yeah. and I said it yesterday. If you've got to the point of our group, and we did it on a live yesterday, you're not here because you want to moderate, I'm afraid. You're here because you've not been able to do. So, yeah. really blunt. Alex on. says. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Go, go for it. <laughs> I've got a couple of questions here. One for William. Really mm. short, sweet. How long have you been sober for? Six years and a bit. There you go. So, uh, that was from Libby. Um, and then one for Simon that basically says they've been trying out. This is um, this is also from Libby. Libby, you're quite a lousy person. <laughs> 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 so, that Libby wants to know, Simon, she's been looking at your information about alcohol free drinks and trying them. Do you never want an alcohol an alcoholic drink? No way. I don't think any of us do. I would, I think if, if someone offered me like 10 million pounds, I, I just wouldn't drink one. It's just, it's my life has been game changing for me. No, there's just no way, no way at all. I'm sure everyone else, like, is there any sum of money anyone would take for an alcoholic drink here? I don't no. think there probably is. No. You know, I remember Simon and um, my son saying to me, and I was with my husband at the time, who was a very heavy drinker and he had stopped but he'd kind of stopped because i had stopped so he'd done it for me at that time um, and my mo and my son said if you could have the most expensive bottle of champagne like it cost a million pounds would you taste it and i was like no and i remember my husband at the time said yeah i definitely and i knew at that moment that we were on completely different levels and then I had this conversation with my mum about because we have morbid conversations like this like if you were going to die tomorrow would you have a drink and we both agreed because my mum's now sober as well that there's no way that we would touch a drink I, I think people in the group tomorrow. would feel like that mm. I bet people who are on this chat now if we ask for a vote and a bit of a thumbs up about we'll get a load of thumbs up thumbs up if you never want to drink again <laughs> Sat watching this. It's interesting, isn't it? If you were on <laughs> death row, like if I was on death row and today was my last day and I knew I was being executed at midday, why would I want to have a lethal injection with a hangover? Surely I want to be present and see everybody there. I don't want to hang out. Like, no yeah, without having a stinking hangover to make it even worse. But Simon, worse right. So we, we did um, a podcast, funnily enough, that was out last Saturday with a man called George that is incarcerated on death row. And he has gone sober. So there's, because um, they can still get their hands on things on death row. Um, but he has chosen to go sober. So it was very interesting that actually. So you'll have to listen to it. Yeah, I, I, I listened to it. It was awesome. Sorry, who else wanted to go? Dave, did you want to say? Yeah. Can I, I was just going to say that a common question people say is how do you uh, know you're never going to drink again? Because you never know that. Yeah. And on paper, you should actually say, well, I don't know that, but I kind of do. I, I know that I will never want to drink again because I, I, I've got to this stage in my life now that, you know, we talk about um, like what I said before to everyone is that I used to look through life like through a straw like that. And now it's like a Hubble telescope. My yeah. life has expanded so much now that I, if I went backwards, I might as well just give up on life because I just... I just couldn't do it. I just wouldn't want to do it. Mandy. Yeah. Mandy. I think, um, I think that's part of the the most difficult thing, like, you know, about this is it's it's not the decision, but it's making the decision. And once when you make that decision, it's like none of us are gonna want to drink again because that decision isn't an option, like it's just it's gone. Like it doesn't feature in my life and I've made a life where that de that decision does not get rocked. Like that is the anchor of my life. And the difficulty with people that are still stuck in that should I, should I moderating, maybe putting it there as a perhaps, that's what's hard. But getting to that point of, of saying I'm done 
is very difficult but it's like you know I used to be a smoker and it was exactly the same it was like smoking was my identity I smoked roll-ups I could make roll-ups in the dark you know I could like it was very much part of who I was um, and it was incredibly hard to stop smoking and it was when I really stopped then it was easy as fuck <laughs> It's just, but it's making the decision, which is hard. Which was hardest, smoking or drinking, quitting? Um, smoking. Was it? Yeah, I mean, when you were talking about death row, I was like, oh, I might have to. Maybe just one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Alex. I think I'd have a KFC. Um, I've, I've got a question um, from, from um, Holly. I think you might be able to answer this, Scott. If you don't mind sometimes i just want that mental release of oblivion how do i get past that oh that's a great question uh yeah so there's a tactic uh that i use uh a lot uh and i call it sorry if you can hear the lawnmower the guy showed up just now to mow my lawn so. <laughs> um so uh the tactic that i like to talk about is this question of what do i need right now um super simple it's just about asking yourself that question as drinkers we get we really lose practice at asking ourselves that question. Um, and so oblivion, right? What is oblivion? Well, that's what, relaxation? Maybe that's uh, some sort of engagement. Maybe there's a thought that's running around in your head that it's difficult for you to let go of, like you just want to get away from that. Um, so what I always recommend in those situations is figure out other ways to do that, right? Alcohol isn't the only way. And maybe this is a belief, right? That's worth saying is like, hey, alcohol is the only way for me to detach. That could be worth running through the act technique, um, but really kind of getting underneath that idea of oblivion. So the way that I did that when I quit drinking, um, because I called it detach. I just said, I want to detach. Um, and so the way that I did that is I just, I started writing out different things that meant detached for me, right? And so for me, that was, that was terms like relaxed. To me, that was terms like not thinking about work, not thinking about, I had big financial problems at the time that I quit drinking. Um, so it was just like, oh, I want to detach from these things that are around me, right? I took that word detach and I really started defining it. And through defining it, I came up with some awesome things that were really helpful for me. You know, for one of those things was going for a walk, oddly enough. I don't exactly know why, um, but I would, you know, I'd put on my tennis shoes and just go for a walk and I, with no podcast, nothing, just move. And just moving for me somehow helped. So if you can further define what that idea of oblivion is, if you can further define like what is actually underneath, like put yourself in that state and say, all right, if I was in oblivion, how would I feel? That's a perfect example, a perfect way to start pulling out some other things that you can do in, in, instead of drinking to get to a similar state. That's a great answer. Kate's got yeah, some and this oblivion. that you just re reminded me of, you know, the, the something that Mandy and I talk about quite a lot is finding the ing, finding your thing, and the state of flow, which is, um, it was Boris Selt, no, it isn't, it's Michaeli, whatever he was, who studied post war survivors and what made them thrive. And this sort of this amazing resilience study that basically found creatives really thrived. And part of that was then he deconstructed and it was the state of flow. So when you are maybe walking that kind of rhythmic, quite meditative sort of thing, you could be knitting, you could be painting, you could be doing, you know, singing. Um, so doing, doing an activity which engages you, which will give you that mental off switch, maybe what, yeah. what you might be craving it's, so it's that's the thing sorry scott like, yeah but like, go ahead uh, yeah with what scott was saying as well like actually i tried to spend some time identifying the things that when i do them i lose track of time yeah. because i enjoy them and i'm so immersed like you said walking like if i go walking or running in the woods i just lose track of time often i lose track of myself in the woods and can't get home but like actually what are those things that bring you joy and you just lose time and you know that's where you can find your oblivion your detachment mm. sorry scott go ahead oh i was just going to say another thing i found is that i needed to do something with my hands um, yeah. So I started playing the guitar again. I also took up knitting of all things, but it was just, it was that movement and it, it just like, that is what helped me. It helped me detach. Alex. That's <laughs> always got that beard, Dave. I got to be careful and not put it too close. It. Otherwise we have all types of problems. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, 
Simon, before we fi finish, are you okay to just answer one question? Because you've been hosting and not really answered anything. So I think yeah, far away. Your opinion on this. So last one, Libby Beck. So Libby's scared about what's going to happen after lockdown. She said she's coping fine with not drinking now, but after lockdown, she's worried because even though she started her sobriety before lockdown, she'd been drinking for so long. She's in her early 60s. <coughs> And she's worrying how it'll be when she hooks up with a drinking friend. So how is she going to cope with those triggers when it, we're back to normality, I think is the question, Simon. Well, I think, I mean, I didn't quite hear. Did you say how long Libby's been alcohol free? No, she said she started it before lockdown. So I'm okay, so maybe and... seven, eight weeks, something like that, which is amazing. But so I would say by the time lockdown ends, you'll probably actually be feeling up even stronger than you might be feeling right now and you'll probably be feeling more of a shift going on anyway i would definitely be which you are continuing to educate yourself and tuning into things like this reading books strengthening your resolve but i guess it comes down when i first quit social events you know i was a little bit scared about them and i was very careful about what i did and didn't do and this comes back to those boundaries and just being okay with what you're going to do just be gentle on yourself i remember i had some pretty boozy events planned after i quit and i started switching them out you know a bit like when, when you have a diet you do sugar swaps i did booze swaps so i'd take my son bowling or take him to the cinema instead of going to those events that i had planned so i would just be really gentle on yourself you don't need to go steaming into a huge sort of social boozy situation and even if your friends are saying let's have a party let's all drink 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 you don't have to go and you, you can be kind to yourself and if you do obviously we shared some social tips around that earlier but and i think you know fear and kind of anxiety around things they do come up and the as i've said before my belief is the biggest antidote to fear is having a little bit of courage and sometimes that courage is to actually say no and sometimes it's it's to go it, it, it depends but uh, you know pr prepare but i think you'll be feeling pretty damn strong by then yeah i agree before we go barbara's invited us all around for dinner guys we all up for that Yay! Yay! Yeah, we'll definitely <laughs> we've got how many vegans uh, we'll let you know our catering requirements <laughs> yeah, definitely alcohol free though yeah. <laughs> yeah. anyone else want to add anything no, and it's been awesome, Scott, coming on. Thanks so much. Yeah, yeah thanks, thanks for inviting us. Yeah. Yeah, I'm brilliant. jealous of your beer, mate. Yeah, you can the, get there one day, Dave. Hard. This is a beard week. Envy. Week, so. <laughs> we'll, we'll all work hard on beards for next yeah. week. Oh, mine's on its way, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's all happening. Good lighting. Yeah. Oh, thanks again, everyone. It's been great seeing you all again. I love catching up with you all on a Saturday. It's like my therapy, this. I don't know about how you mm. yeah. but I love it yeah. every week. Look forward to it. So, thanks, thanks Simon, for hosting. Yeah, no, thanks yeah. so much. Thanks again, Scott, and everyone else coming on. It's been brilliant. All right, thank See you. Soon. You're a legend, yes. Scott. Cheers. Wow. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.